This week on Writers Inc. I was talking to another author about this, and I think the great thing about crime novels, in a way, I mean, I think crime and horror cross over quite a lot anyway. Thrillers and horror, it can easily cross. And I think as long as you've got a mystery at the centre of it, there's, you know, there's a mystery, there's a crime that has to be solved. You can kind of do anything with the rest of it, you know? You can have it in the past, present, future. You can you can have it apocalyptic. You can have vampires. I think as long as you keep that central mystery um, that keeps the, the reader wanting to read, then you can create lots of other stuff around it. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. I'm Jenna Brown. Jay Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So I, I, I usually try to come up with something to talk about at the beginning of this thing. And like I, I literally have nothing. Like The entire week has gone by. Absolutely nothing exciting has happened in my life. Um, we're going to Disney World. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that. I'm a huge fan of Disney. I'm a, the, one of the biggest Disney geeks. Uh, Disney World <laughs> geeks, anyway. So. Would you call yourself a Disney adult? Maybe. It, I think there's negative connotations to that, right? Like, I don't think I want to uh, claim maybe. that. Maybe. Right. Do you have, like, uh, you're a whole house deco- decorated no. Disney? No. Uh, but no. I, <laughs> we did go to Disney World for our honeymoon when we were married 18 some odd years ago and uh, have been back several times. So. Do, you, do you wear the ears? I have ears. The ears, yeah. You I do need have to get some ears. some ears. I like the restaurants and the hotels. I don't like the parks. I mean, I like the parks, but they're always overcrowded. Yeah. So it just annoys me. Yeah. One of the best times I ever had in my life was I went <laughs> to Orlando for a conference and I had another one uh, that was going to be like two weeks later. So I laid over and I was there by myself at Disney World for like four days. And I didn't, I didn't go into a single park. I went, <laughs> I spent the whole time at like Disney That's Springs. Uh, I went, I wrote <laughs> from like, I made it a, a, a goal to write from every single resort hotel. Uh, spent the whole the whole week basically geeking out, doing everything but going into the parks. I'd rather do that. That's fun. The resorts are fun. We're we're staying at the Animal Kingdom one this time. We, we haven't been to that one yet. Um, last time we were at I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like a New Orleans themed park. I think it is um, called New Orleans. Isn't I think it? It is. That, that so. would that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. That, would, that would that would <laughs> explain Orleans. a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like we, I think we, I think my wife planned like three days of just hanging out at the hotel because you know there's water parks, there's tons of stuff to do just right there. You don't have to go to the theme parks. Yeah. So. Yeah. They have a good restaurant too. So. Yeah. We stayed there one time. It's cool. We, like the animals do come up to your windows and stuff, which is neat. And they have good food. So that is a good one. Nice. But yeah, I took my son there. Was it last last winter break? Just for a day. We just stopped over because we were going on a cruise and we just went to, uh, what's it called? That Hollywood Studios and did the Star Wars. Oh. He liked that one day better than the cruise. So. <laughs> yeah. I liked the cruise better than the one day, but whatever. <laughs> I finally got my daughter into into Star Wars. Um, you know, like there, there's a Disney like the, on the Disney Channel, they've got some cartoons now for Star Wars yeah. too. So like she got hooked on one that was like Young Jedi, something something or other. Um, but I made the mistake like a year ago of telling her like the only place you can get a real lightsaber is at Disney World um, <laughs> because like I ordered some from Amazon and they're like you know these cheap little plastic ones that break after you know you hit them on something. Yeah. Um, so now she thinks she's gonna be able to get a real lightsaber when we walk into Disney World. So I I, I hope they actually sell those there. They do my son well i don't know about disney world i've actually never been um to disney world a west coast problems but in disneyland they do Uh, my son has one um that he got at disneyland years ago um it's like one of his most treasured possessions um i raised my son correctly (laughs) he is a jedi like his mother before him (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> cool all right well what is in the news okay first up uh whilst while streaming giants slash budgets and users flock from x the uk's biggest publishers are using ai with a little help from prince harry to get us hooked back on books 
Sarah Lloyd from Pan uh, Macmillan highlighted the potential for AI to revolutionize how books are marketed and sold by using machine learning and natural language processing. AI can now allow publishers to achieve greater impact with relatively smaller resources. Despite the rise of digital media, the UK book market experienced significant growth, reaching record revenue levels in the last year, driven by major releases. This, this suggests that traditional books can still thrive amidst digital competition. Publishers like uh, Pam McMillan are using AI tools to, to rediscover and monetize books from their extensive backlists. These are books that have been published but may not have been heavily marketed or they remain underutilized resources. Shimmer, a new AI advertising platform, uses a three-step process to match books with potential readers based on psychological profiles, enhancing reader satisfaction and potentially increasing sales. This platform has shown promising early results, significantly improving the return on ad spend and boosting sales figures for our featured titles. I'm intrigued by that, but I, I do worry that that, that in itself can b- quickly become a walled garden. You know? Well, I, I think, yeah, what's really interesting about this is the Shimmer AI, right? Yeah. So it's using large language models to, and, uh, to define it, what it called in the article, the works structural patterns and psychological values. They're calling this book DNA. And then they generate an image to match that book DNA. And then they put this content onto social media, matching to readers, quote, psychological dispositions. Um, Where are they getting you know, that? means the writers are going to have to right? <laughs> the, the, big, the big fight right now is writers don't want their work scanned by these models. And so they don't, you know, yep. they're not going to be included. So this is a good argument for maybe uh, we need to be thinking about that, get our books in that. Yeah. I feel two kind of ways about it, right? Because he's like, they're talking about, okay, we have this reward models that ensures our campaigns are continuously self-optimizing readers are being matched with psychologically suited books um so they're saying you know this will give them better reads a more positive experience so basically they're trying to gamify it and cause addictions which i'm usually against but maybe not for reading i don't know. <laughs> it's gonna at least put the right books in front of you right I mean, right yeah. yeah and uh they've said that this uh the creator of shimmer said that the books are sealed away from the training sets of their models. That's what they're claiming. Mm-hmm. And that they build these image on uh, one pixel from the book DMA, DNA. So I I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I think it's kind of a cool thing that maybe backlist books that were overlooked now have a chance yeah. um, to find a new audience. Yeah. Well, think about what's available. Like our profiles on Goodreads are all public, right? I don't know. Yeah. If, I think by default it's that way. So you can see every book that you've ever coded on Goodreads that you you liked and you read. Um, if you drill down, you can see you know how long it took you to read each of those books. So that means that they're able to scrape all of that data. They can tell what books you flew through, which ones you dragged on, which ones you didn't finish. Um, so all that data is there, whether we want it to be or not. Uh, I'd be curious to see my own profile on this. That. I, I would just like to see the data, see what it thinks I'm actually interested in, or a list of books that it thinks that I would like, just to see how accurate it is. Yeah, I was going to say, I think my biggest struggle is always with algorithms, because like I am such a mood-driven person. Like Even on Spotify, like I have such a hard time. I am just constantly going, I, I just get tired of what they think I want to listen to after a yeah. while that I have to go in and change it. So I just... It, it's interesting. I just, um, I don't when know you, if it, like you said, will become like just this feedback loop that then just targets like the same types of books instead of introducing you to something that might be different that you'd still be interested in. I don't know. You start going, you start going down these rabbit holes, right? So like on, on Spotify, I, I listened to, um, I forget what soundtrack it was, but I asked it to play a soundtrack from a movie and it played that and then it played another one and then it started to devolve into other soundtracks for things I've never heard of before. Mm-hmm. And within like a, you know an hour, it was playing like music from Westerns. Yeah. And you know, then, <laughs> then it kind of got stuck on that thing. You know, I, I guess just yeah. because I let it play instead of stopping it, it figured that's what I wanted to, wanted to hear. Well, the real question is, how long did it take before it was just playing the Beatles? Because that's what I get no matter what I plug in. 
<laughs> yeah. It's like six degrees of separation from the Beatles. So uh, I need to try that. I actually don't use Spotify, but yeah, I'm like Jenna. Like there will be one minute that I'm listening to like magical indie girl bands and the next minute it's going to be heavy metal. So yeah, and you it's can just, try. And then <laughs> the thing with Spotify too is then it starts playing like the same songs. Like, you know, yeah. um, I guess that's why I notice it because I'll just be like, did I just listen to this? And so then you have to go in and sort of like shake it up. So I guess I do like that they're trying to target backlist titles because I do think that that's yeah. an interesting feature. It's just um, yeah. algorithms are sort of the bane of my existence. So I don't know how excited I can get about another <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully this is not like a strictly... Well, Amazon may have an answer for that. Yeah. I'm, they Coming might. up in the next news piece. Well, let's, let's dive into that because we got a couple of different things we can talk about with Amazon. Uh, so Amazon adds Andrew Ng, a leading voice in artificial intelligence to its board of directors. Amazon is adding artificial intelligence visionary Andrew Ng to its board of directors. He'll replace a seat vacated by Judy McGrath, a former CEO of MTV. Ng's company has invested billions in Anthropic, which is partnering with Amazon to develop generative AI tech. Amazon CEO Andy Jass suggested generative AI could be the next big thing in Amazon's business. You, you, when someone tells you who they are, listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> this was interesting because they actually formed a, a brand new company, I think, to, to house all this stuff. And I, I was kind of curious. That, I'm wondering if they're doing that from a legal standpoint, like if they just want to be able to keep anybody that comes after this from being able to go after Amazon's coffers. Um, yeah, I might just be digging into it a little bit too, too deep, but um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see them jump jump in here you know, along with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right on the money there because uh, Andrew Ng has invested billions in Anthropic and Amazon has invested $4 billion in Anthropic. Um, so it, it's just kind of like what is, what is going on? So yeah, obviously they've moved away from media. Goodbye, MTV. And they're, they're jumping in hard on AI. Yeah. So, yeah. Which has the potential to utterly replace um MTV and others like it like that. I watched a video, a guy plugged in. So he took, there's a YouTuber. He took like this, basically the transcript from one of his videos and there's a website he took it to. I think it's called pseudo S U D O. I think that's it. But, uh, he drops it in and that site generates music from any text you give it and you can choose the different styles and stuff. And he did a variety of them. Like, he did one that was like an anime yeah. thing. He did one that was like Taylor Swift. Uh, and it did this astounding job with it. And then he coupled that with AI video from one of these other sites. And just, it was like it was like a, a, a custom you know music video with a custom yeah. music track. So who needs yeah, yeah. most of media anymore, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. It's, it's called Suno, S-U-N-O. Suno, that's what it yeah. is. And it, it's wild, all these things that are coming out now. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I must be doing something wrong. I, I tried one the other day that takes um, like a YouTube video and chops it up, and it's supposed to make TikTok videos out of right. it. So I took one of our podcasts just to see if it would be able to create those you know little short TikTok videos we used to do. Um, and it did it, but like it, it didn't start or stop any of them like at a place where I would do it. Like it, it basically started one in the middle of a conversation and then ended it like in the middle of that conversation. So like nothing yeah. was, you know, it, it seemed like very random. Um, I don't know. They're surprisingly. <laughs> I, I, I probably missed, I probably missed a toggle or a button or something I was supposed to click. No, you're just old. <laughs> <laughs> or that. I would just like AI all the problems like Google used to be a good search engine and Amazon used to be a good shopping experience. And like all these things used to be good and now they're no longer good. So I am just hoping that, um, you know, they stop creating like hilarious dog videos and just fix their core products and make them <laughs> in my day, we again. used to have to type so, things so go, into search. <laughs> so go back to the funny cat videos. Yeah. That's where they're, they're, their bread was buttered. Yeah, I, I need uh, the AI to train me on how to and, use the and, AI. You know, oddly enough, it was Andrew Ng's company. I, I believe that uh, he taught um, AI how to recognize cats in a video without ever telling it what a cat was. So, 
Oh, there you go. Nice. We're right on the money. Right back to basics. <laughs> back to basics. Let's throw in a couple more little th- mentions of Amazon here. We haven't had enough. Uh, Amazon puts all three Claude AI models on bedrock. Uh, this enhances, quote, the ability of customers of all sizes to rapidly test, build, and deploy generative AI applications across their organizations. That's, you know, that's like what yeah. we're talking about, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thing. Anthropic owns yeah. Claude. So yeah. it's no, like they're all, you know, yeah. <laughs> Man. They're all together. I mean, out of all the ones that I've tried, Claude has been the, the best, you know, as far as coming up with text. Like you drop a, like a portion of your book in there, tell it to come up with a description, you know, like a 200 word sales description, that kind of thing. Claude is very good at that. Yeah. I wouldn't know they block Canadians or have historically. I well, for, for good reason. Recently. You guys really shouldn't have <laughs> access. Is that like a recent version of Claude? Because I used Claude to try to, I was playing around with it because I thought, oh, this might be a good way to get like little paragraph summaries of chapters. Um, and it it was it it was interesting what it thought each chapter was about. <laughs> I get, so I used, uh, so I'm using ChatGPT the, and I'm paying to use it so I can I get chat GPT four or whatever. And, uh, I, this latest book. So I have a new book. We forgot to mention, man, I, we have, I have a new book coming out, the forgotten rune, May 15th. Uh, <laughs> anyway, That's my uh, shameless plug, but I plugged that into chat GPT with, uh, the intention of first, I was using it to kind of help me with doing a, a final edit grammar check. And it, it found some interesting things and it was, so that was useful. But since it was in there, I asked it like to generate a description, which I no way used. Uh, and I had it give me a list of the characters and a one sentence breakdown of their role in the book. And that was interesting because it skipped some primary characters and focused very heavily on some like side characters. Uh, but one of the things I did was inspired by JD. I asked it to create a list of uh, like b- book club questions that I could use. And uh, it did a, r- a remarkable job of that. But what it's terrible at is summarizing the book and summarizing the chapters. It's just not really good at that. But it, it was great for like you know exploring themes and stuff you know along those lines. That that was that was a good use of it. Maybe my problem is I just keep using the free version because I <laughs> refuse to pay for anything. So <laughs> maybe yeah. that's where it, this is all going wrong for me. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it, I I got I've gotten some decent results out of the free version too from time to time. It just depends on what you're going for, but Oh, I would I just wanted to mention that um back to Jenna's point that Amazon is rolling out Maestro, which oh, yeah. is um uh AI playlist generator that helps you cl- make whatever playlist you can think of. It says plus all the ones you can't. You put in any prompt, you can even put in an emoji. Like this is my mood and I'll give you a playlist. That is cool. <laughs> so, um <laughs> And I would rather do that. And that, that seems like that would be much easier on the go than, than what Spotify and others make you do, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I, yeah. can, I can never figure out a way to just, like, I just want to tell it, play me music of this type and, and relax about it. But instead, yeah. I have to, like, tell it a specific song. And then I have to, you know, when it starts playing something random after that and, and then eventually gets to the Beatles, like, I'm just stuck. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see if Maestro does any better than Spotify. Anyways, Amazon is going hard on that AI. When you're writing a book, the first draft is the easy part. It's what comes after that hurts. The confusion, the self-doubt, questioning this, questioning that, trying to get feedback so you can feel confident making changes. It's a lot to handle. And that's why I'm delighted to say that this episode of the Writers Inc. podcast is sponsored by Autocrit. One of the most value-packed memberships for any author, Autocrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that can make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. From start to finish, everything you need to produce a strong, confident story is at your fingertips. Get instant developmental feedback on plot, conflict, characters, themes, and more through the Story Analyzer and edit each sentence to perfection with a complete interactive editing suite packed with reports and insights. And that's not to mention additional benefits like private community forums and live members only support and writing sessions every single week. It's an incredible place to be for any writer. 
and listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can take advantage of Lifetime AutoCrit Pro membership for one single payment. That's right, no renewal fees. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get yourself a Lifetime membership now. Big thanks to AutoCrit for sponsoring the show. All right. And with that, JD, who is up this week? This week, we've got CJ Tudor. CJ burst onto the thriller scene with her debut novel, The Chalk Man, and she's followed that up with hit after hit after hit. Her latest novel is called The Gathering and released on April 9th. Here she is, CJ Tudor. So welcome back. Uh, You have a new book. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. A new book coming out, The Gathering, that I would call a police procedural with vampires. Is that fair to say? Yes. That was kind of how I pitched it to my agent. Um, and actually, but now, no, never want to miss an opportunity. I'm just pitching it to people as true detective with vampires. I love so, it. <laughs> that was, when I pitched it to my agent, I said, well, look, it's, I'm going to set it in Alaska for various reasons. I think it's a great setting. And it's a small, isolated town. And there's this brutal murder and this plucky female detective. And, and there's vampires. <laughs> she was like, OK, great. <laughs> so what was the inspiration for this? I think this is your first time doing supernatural if, if i'm not it's wrong it's the first time i've gone full on i think it's the first time i've gone sort of full on supernatural i think it's the first time i've set a book specifically um sort of somewhere sort of outside the uk although the drift was kind of set in north america but it, it wasn't sort of specified right um so it's the first time i've set a book sort of you know in alaska um and actually i, I i'd always wanted to write a vampire novel i, I love vampires uh, you know yeah. one of my favorite films is the lost boys i love near dark 30 days of night uh you know i did let the right one in vampires are just great they're just they're just a brilliant subject but i knew if i wrote it i i had to bring something new to the table because no pun intended vampires have kind of been done to death you know and i didn't want to kind of do a traditional vampire story I wanted to have something different so it kind of the idea kind of came back I, I liked the idea of Alaska as a setting because of the darkness because that you know they've got lots you've got small isolated towns lots right. of wilderness you know which is always good in terms of writing to have an isolated town that's cut off from everything um and I just had this idea of this this small town and I had this idea of the vampires being hunted so it started off quite early with kind of one of the early scenes in the book, the idea of vampire skulls mounted like trophies, essentially. So that this kind of the idea basically came about. What if there was this world essentially where vampires had always existed uh, with this uh, uneasy kind of relationship with sort of humans, essentially. But they don't really pose a threat to humans for centuries. They've subsisted on animal blood. But because of fear and superstition, they've been killed and they've been hunted into near extinction so now they're actually a protected species there is a law that protects them from you know being hunted by humans or killed and there's only a few colonies left that live in kind of remote areas and are protected by law unless they're deemed to pose a threat to humans in which case they can be a cull authorized so it's, it's almost as if you know we, we treat them like animals in this society so into this kind of background comes um there's this small Alaskan town called Dead Heart, which has a vampire colony nearby. And this young boy is found brutally murdered with all the blood drained from his body. And it, it echoes a killing from 25 years ago. And straight away, the town are like, well, you know, obviously it's a vampire killing. It's one of the colony. We want to cull. They're, they're a threat to our, our town. And into this comes Detective Barbara Atkins, who's a specialist in vampire killings. Um, and it's, it's up to her to determine whether this is, you know, a, a, an unprovoked attack by a vampire, in which case she has the power to authorise a cull of the colony, or whether there's something else going on, you know. And she has to be really sure because, it's a, you know, it's a big responsibility. So obviously there's something else going on. Yeah, there's more to it than just that. It's a small town with lots of secrets and they're isolated. And, of course, they're getting cut off by a snowstorm. Um, and, you know, Barbara's there with these hostile townsfolk. And she's got one ally in the disgraced former sheriff who investigated this case 25 years ago. Um, but there's lots of dark secrets. You know, it's, we never quite know what's going on. Um, and I had a lot of fun with it. You know, it was it was great to world build, to create yeah. this, this sort of different law with the vampires, because in, in my book, they're not really supernatural beings. They're, they're more, they live a long time. They live centuries compared to our decades but they're not immortal. They can't transform into bats. You can see them in <laughs> mirrors, you know. So they are kind of more mortal, but a different sort of species. 
Um, and that was quite fun to play with it. And of course, they have their own kind of sort of, um, you know, lore and their own kind of um, backstory. And and it was it was really great to kind of have the vampires, you know, you know, probably they're scary vampires. They're not twinkly vampires, but kind of reinvent the kind of them a little bit. And that was a lot of fun to play with. Yeah. So there are a lot of things you said there that I want to dig more into. Yes. Um, so you decided to do a vampire book, but they they were done to death for a while. Uh, yes. Mostly in part to our sparkly vampires and the Twilight <laughs> right? There was just a flood of vampire books because everybody wanted vampire books. Yes. And then all of a sudden it was like, no more vampire books. No more vampire books. So I'm just curious about, you're like, okay, I'm going to do a vampire book. I love vampire books. Um was it a market decision or just a personal decision or a little bit of both? Just personal. I mean, I never, I, I might probably give my, my agent and my editors nightmares because I never, I, I'm not like a commercial, I don't think what, what is everyone else doing? What should I write? What would be, what would be marketable? I just go, oh, I've got this idea. I think it'd be fun to write it. Um, and I thought it would be fun to write. And I'd go back to, cause I'd always wanted to do a vampire book. I mean, you know, I say I'm, I'm wearing my Salem's lot t-shirt at the moment. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I am a fan of the genre. But again, yeah, I wanted I wanted it to be different. And I think what 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 when I started writing, I realized in a way, although it was about vampires, it was actually about lots of other things. And you often yes. find that with genre, it's a good way to sort of look at other other ask questions, look at look at society. So you know, at its heart, it's a it's a crime novel, it's a mystery with vampires. Um, but also, it was an interesting way to look at how we the divisions in society, how we treat people who aren't like us, who are as we see them other to us you know enabled me to talk about things like religion and racism and how we treat indigenous people and all of these things wrapped up in kind of a genre novel essentially talking about vampires but able but letting me tackle other subjects so that became really interesting to look at and I did kind of want to be one-sided in it as well because I think at one point you know you know Barbara's quite liberal and at one point she's speaking to someone from the town and and, and she admits you know it's easy to be liberal when the wolf isn't at your own door, you know, when you right. know, these people have to live side by side with this colony and, and there's a lot of fear and suspicion on both sides. Um, and, and I think it like tackles that, how we, we've become set in our kind of opinions um, and we, we find it very hard to see the other person's opinion. And then everybody has a reason for, for the way they view things. Uh, so that was really interesting to play with all of that as well. Yeah, I think it's really important to take uh, other perspectives. And I love that about your books. Your books are always... Uh, they're entertaining, but they're not just entertaining. They're always saying something else as, as well, <laughs> which I think just adds another dimension. And as you said, you know, exploring uh, racism, uh, prejudice against religion yeah. and looking at everyone's different perspective yeah. on that. So, yeah, I think it adds just a lovely layer of depth to your work. So. Oh, thank you. And I think, you know, it's not something and I, I, at the end of it, I, I want to write an entertaining book. I want to write a good mystery. I want to write a book that's that's thrilling, exciting, you know, interesting to people, entertaining, ultimately, at the end of the day. But, you know, if you can work in other issues as well, I think it just adds more meat onto the bones, really, as well. And, you know, I don't necessarily starting off, start off writing that with that intention. But that just really grew with the book. It, it, it grew organically as the book kind of took shape, really. Yeah. And um your vampires, I want to talk about it because you talked yes. about some of the films that you love that I also love. Lost Boys, Let the Right One In is probably my favorite That's horror right. movie of all cool. time. Yeah. Anyone listening to this, please watch the original. Don't watch the American version. Yes, watch the original. I haven't watched the American version. I've watched the original, which is brilliant. I've read the book. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel I needed to watch the, the remake. No, no, yeah. it was it, it starts with a car explosion and everything ah. that was subtle is um <laughs> explained yeah. in black and white. And I just went, Oh, well, that's a yeah. shame. So you can save yourself that one. I'll save myself that one. <laughs> you can <laughs> save yourself the Michael Bay version of uh let the right one in. But um yeah, so and they do some interesting things because I know a lot of um, maybe more traditional vampires, vampires, there's usually a class issue, right? Vampires have a lot of money and uh, yeah. endless resources. You didn't go that route at no. all. <laughs> so <laughs> how did you approach like the realistic development of vampires to keep them relatable and grounded, yeah. especially meshing them into a police procedural? Well, I had this idea that kind of like they they basically kind of been driven from sort of most civilized sort of human areas because through you know superstition and fear, and, and they're kind of forced to live this almost what say nomadic existence. They kind of live like say in remote areas. The, the vampires in the Gathering have made their home in an old abandoned mine 
in the mountains. Um, and they have their own society and existence, but it, it's very much a very basic existence. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of, because they're not permitted to like work or live amongst humans. There is that division. So they can't just, you know, they can't live alongside humans. They have to live a very basic, primitive existence. So, you know, they get by, they, they kind of raise their own animals for the blood and they have their own rules in their society and they kind of keep very much away from humans. They are protected, but they, they live with fear and suspicion of humans and the two don't mingle. That's very, you know, kind of not, not a done thing. Um, so that, yeah, they're kind of like kind of gritty, and, and kind of brutal. I mean, the leader of my vampire colony, which again was great fun to play with, because it's, it's another thing I think is quite fascinating, is a vampire who's, you know, centuries old, but exists in the body of a nine, ten year old child. Um, and she's called Athelinda. And she was wonderful fun to write as well, because she, you know, she's got all these centuries of existence. And, you know, she's kind of brutal and scary and terrifying, but, you know, looks like this kind of angelic kind of nine, ten year old girl. Um, and, and she was a lot of fun to write as well. And, and it looks, I, I, with my vampires as well, I wanted to look about how hard it might be as well to, to live this life over hundreds of years. But, you know, there's, there's kind of like not a lot to fill their lives in a way. And, and, and also we talk about, you know, how, you know, how you live that long, how kind of death comes to them eventually, which also perhaps isn't pretty either. So it was, it was a lot of fun to do that and, and make them feel like they were real, these kind of outcasts from society. Um, and, and how they kind of live on the edge of society. Um, and, and yeah, that was kind of how I sort of really wanted to present them. And, and it's not, you know, we, we're not, they are, you know, they have the capability as we see through Athelinda to do very brutal things, but, in, but also they are equally persecuted as well. So yeah, it was a great balance to kind of, kind of write. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved the departures that you took with that and just them envying humans and what humans had. And yeah, the death was, you know, when you live for centuries, how long does it take you to die? Which yeah. is horrifying. <laughs> I'll leave that there. <laughs> so were there any other characters that kind of evolved in unexpected ways as you wrote them? I love that your um your detective is kind of not the stereotype either. She's kind of out of shape and can't really chase yeah. down her perps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she says at one point, like she's trying to chase a suspect and she wish she'd worn a sports bra. And yeah. it's, it's, she's, I mean, Barbara's great. She's like, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 50s now and I wanted, I didn't want to write a young kind of hot detective. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's older, she's 50, she's not in great shape, but, you know, but she's smart and people underestimate her. Um, and I think that's what's nice about Barbara. She can play the kind of like, you know, I'm just good old Barbara, you know, and, and people look at her and, and underestimate her because she's, she is really sharp and she's really astute and she's good at reading people. So she was, you know, Barbara's voice was the, the voice that really sold it for me when I started writing. I think once you get that voice, then, you know, that, that's how you, that's what leads me into the story. So Barbara was a lot of fun to write. She was a great character. Tucker as well, the, the sheriff who, you know, she ends up working with, um, from who investigated the crime, pre the previous crime 25 years ago. And he's become kind of an outcast um, from society for various reasons, you know, because he didn't, you know, quite get the culprit before. And there's lots of suspicion with him and animosity with the townsfolk. Um, and he was a good character to kind of... Um, right too and there's also little side characters there's there's a preacher in the town um mm -hmm. reverend <laughs> yeah reverend gray mm -hmm. and, and she again is an enigmatic character and again it was interesting to look at how you know from her point of view the religious point of view the vampires are the spawns of satan they should be eliminated and and there's this movement that thinks that they should all be killed because you know they're, they're, they're against god um and so it was interesting to look at that perspective as well um, and, and again, she was a fun character to write. And she's yeah. a character, again, who has her own uh, secrets. So the, 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 yeah, there was just so much juicy characters and such a lot of fun to be had with the story, I think. And the town itself is kind of a character, too, because Dead Heart itself, mm -hmm. the, the, the name, the atmosphere. I mean, this is a town that kind of keeps its Christmas decorations up all year to kind of always have the light. This yeah. idea of always keeping it lit against the darkness. And I love that image of them coming into town. Like, I think it's described as this nightmare before Christmas nightmare yeah. because it's kind of like this strange little town with Christmas decorations up amongst the sort of, you know, skulls and hunting trophies. So I, I loved that image of it. Um, and we actually went to Alaska because, again, I think you've got to go somewhere if you're going to write about it. So last year we went to Alaska and we stopped in a place called Talkeetna um, okay. for a few days. Yeah. And so Dead Heart, I kind of based it on Talkeetna in a way, but more remote and less, and less I say touristy. When you say touristy, you think there's a lot of stuff there. Talkeetna is like 
one one sort of road with a few shops and bars and things and, and this kind of strange hotel. But I also mixed it with McCarthy Kennecut, which has like this big old abandoned mine, um, which I kind of based the mine on. Um, but it was great to go there because there's lots of little details and things I wouldn't have known had I not visited that I was able to put into the book. Yeah, uh, let's talk about those standing because, yeah, it was a great town. And um, a couple of things I noticed about it. And one was that you gave it such a history, which is yeah. so smart. Like you'd really thought about everything that happened in that town before the story, which I think is, you know, a great writing tip. Sometimes our our places yes, yeah. and our characters just are born on page one. Yes. <laughs> forget to think about all the things that happened before did that like evolve as you were writing or did you think about that um, before? Yeah, you I think kind of, it did. It did evolve. Yeah, because because, because I think with, you know, the vampires having such longevity for a start yeah. um, and they've been around for a while. And a lot of stuff that has happened in the town in the past is very relevant to the present. So the town did have to have quite a long history. And again, I did quite a lot of research on. Um, sort of Alaska and, and, and Talkeetna itself and also the mines in Alaska, the copper, copper mining and the railroad. And then all of that, because I, need, I needed to have all of that knowledge because that all played into the history of, of Dead Heart itself. And, and initially when I was writing it, I, I, I thought Dead Heart was such a good name. But it's one of those things like, I hate like giving places or characters names even that, that feel too unrealistic. That are kind of like cool. It works for the yeah. book, but you kind of go, nobody would ever be called that, or a town would never be called that. Uh, I don't but know. The about Alaska is they have they have such crazy town names. <laughs> and I found there was there was actually a town called Dead Horse, and I was like, okay, there's a town called Dead Horse. There can definitely be a town called Dead Heart, which really fits in with the vampire colony. Yeah, well, I've been guess, to so Hell, Michigan, cool. so you know there is a place called Hell, Michigan. So you can't <laughs> be that far off. If you if you need that for your next book, you know, I'll, let, I'll go take some pictures for you. Let me know. I'm not too far. <laughs> There's a place in, I think it's Wiltshire in the UK called World's End. So oh, I love that. Perfect. <laughs> well, I think that was in a, in a, a movie, wasn't it? It with, was. Uh, Simon it Pegg, was. It was, right? it was a Simon Pegg film. Yeah. The, the, the pub was called World's End. But there is a little village, because I've, I've driven past it before. I see it's the A36 called World's End. I think it's Wiltshire. It's definitely around that area. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's just inspiration right there. That just writes itself. It really is, isn't it? I kind of want to live there. <laughs> So I want to also talk about your setting. So I, I kind of noticed that last time you were on the show, we were talking about uh, your book, The Drift. And I can't help noticing that both of these books take place in a lot of snow. And yes. People get <laughs> cut off from other people. <laughs> I know, you know, I did think actually, oh no, I'm writing another, I'm writing another snowy book, <laughs> this obsession with the cold, but, but it just, it just, you know, it just worked out that way. Yeah, I think both of them, the, the settings with the drift, obviously the, the setting was very, again, it, it, the setting was very relevant, it was, it was essential to the story, because I had to have these people isolated, and I think as a writer, you're, you're always looking at ways to isolate your characters, in my current book, there's time travel involved that isolates my characters. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm always looking for interesting ways to isolate them. But the snowstorm and the drift was just part of the reason they were you know, cut off and isolated. And again, with, with Alaska, you know, I think, you know, you, you want to, you want that claustrophobia of your characters not being able to escape easily or, or for, for help to come easily. It's kind of essential sometimes for that claustrophobic, tense kind of standoff that there's not an easy way out. They can't just call for help or assistance or back up. Um, and so again, yeah, that was, you know, really useful. And, and it's what we play with in fiction, isn't it? You know, we're always looking at ways to make life more difficult for our characters. Yeah. You know, they, they can't just call someone on the phone or, or summon help. There has to be reasons why these things can't happen. Because, of course, you know, m mobile phones in a way are the, the, the bane of every they crime in life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it is, is my yeah mobile phone broken or away from them how could i isolate them more yeah, so, yeah exactly kind of like the storm and, and the claustrophobia and they can't escape and it's making everything more difficult to, to you know to get anywhere or it, it, it was all part and parcel of the building up of the tension um and the claustrophobia within the story really the next the next one is, is there's no snow in it and the one after that i actually might be set somewhere quite warm so i'm, I'm moving away from snow <laughs> I, I think snow I don't I don't know I don't think there are enough books set in winter I love winter a books cold and... setting is great I think somehow <laughs> it just kind of does work for crime and thrillers yeah it's so bleak and so you know and it is the perfect yeah, yeah perfect isolation yeah. and you said in the current book there's time travel the one you're working on now yeah yeah there <laughs> is yeah I haven't done time travel let's let's do a little bit of time travel 
Um, and then, you know, immediately you start writing a book involving any form of time travel. You go, why? Why did I think this was a good idea? This is a nightmare to write. <laughs> but, yes. but no, actually, I'm having, having quite a lot of fun with it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, every, every book I like to do something a bit different. It's, for me, it's quite boring to do the same thing all the time. It's, it's just, you know, it's fun to mix it up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree. Um, so I want to talk a little bit just about your genre blending. So police procedural is kind of its own set of readers. And vampires are kind of their old, their own set of readers. And how did you, you know, <laughs> kind of blend these together and keep the storyline cohesive, but try and satisfy what each reader wants? Or did you even think about that, about the, the two audiences? I, you, you know, I kind of didn't. I just kind of thought it was <laughs> it would be fun. Um, and and you know, I think it just it kind of works. I think it's, I, I was talking to another author about this, and I think the great thing about crime novels, in a way, I mean, I think crime and horror cross over quite a lot anyway. Thrillers and horror, I, I, they, they can easily cross. And I think as long as you've got a mystery at the centre of it, there's you know there's a mystery, there's a crime that has to be solved. You can kind of do anything with the rest of it, you know. You can have it in the past, present, future. You can you can have it apocalyptic. You can have vampires. I think as long as you keep that central mystery um, that keeps the, the reader wanting to read, then you can create lots of other stuff around it. And I, and I hope the two the two mash quite well. So if you know you're you're looking to read a mystery and a crime novel, it is a crime procedural, you know, at, yes. at its centre. Um, but there's this background of, of the vampires in this this different world. So, again, if you're looking for something a little bit spookier um, with this kind of spookier backdrop, I think it works quite well. And I think, you know, crime does match that quite well. I mean, looking at something like True Detective, which has always flirted with that that mm -hmm. supernatural, that undercurrent of something else going on. And, and I think that works really well with crime and investigative kind of thrillers and books. Um, that the two meld quite well. Do we really know what's going on, or is is there something other that we 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 can't quite understand that's happening here? And I think that works really well. Yeah, and this might not be something that you think about. I don't know, but I think about it a lot. Is um, you know, there's a lot of talk about AI and how mm -hmm. it's getting yeah. good at doing kind of straight up uh, genres like straight up yes. romance, straight up thriller, and that maybe like genre blending will be the way to go because it's kind of something that is difficult do you think about that at all or do you just not even worry about it it's i i, I mean you know what there's no point worrying about it is it because yeah. it's it, it's happening and i think you know you know hopefully we'll have measures to kind of but you know I mean, the one thing you can do is stop feeding it obviously i think more and more mm. authors will be having stuff where they're like you know do not feed my work yeah. into ai i don't want that to happen um i think that's that's one way i think i think ai is really useful for lots of things you know, I think it can be a great tool, but like anything, I think you have to kind of have some limits on it. You know, the wonderful thing about art and literature, uh, you know, poetry, or the wonderful creative things in film, you know, the TV, all of those things is that the reason they're so good is because they have a human element. Um, it, even if it may be flawed sometimes, some of my favourite books are slightly flawed. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I think... You, you need that human element. And, and I think and hope that maybe it won't quite keep up with the weird vagaries of the human mind, the way our minds go in, in some things on books. It, it perhaps won't go and do, I'll do that random thing. But I think we perhaps have to be a little bit wary. Yeah. Is, is, is what I think. Um, you know, I, I don't know how far it will go. Have, my husband works in um, radio, um, in audio production. Right. And a friend of his works in a, in a station whereby normally you would pay voiceovers to voice radio commercials um and oh, yeah. already yeah. ai can do that pretty much as well and obviously a lot cheaper right i think mean, this is where we have to look at what's what's the balance you know um you know because that is again people's livelihoods i i think it's difficult and i think so, but sometimes there perhaps might need to be a line drawn where we go no it's not okay to use it to do this yeah but money talks doesn't it if it's cheaper that that's that's what i think we need to be really wary of yeah. yeah. And laws are always so behind uh, technology, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So while I was reading your book, I was uh, reading it electronic because I got, you know, a net galley copy. And I uh, it has the percentage at the bottom. And I just happened to notice that it was at 95, 94, 95 percent mark. And I still did not know who the killer was in this book. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just curious, you know, it got me thinking about you know, as writers, how kind of 
a lot of, of books and a lot of media are ruined because I'm stopping kind of at the halfway point and guessing what's going to happen next. And yes, same more here. often than not, I'm right. So I was just wondering about how did you, you know, get to this 95% mark and we've had so many twists and I don't know. I so pleased you didn't know. I'm so pleased. <laughs> <Who it is. laughs> did you have this ending in mind or did it come yes. about as you were writing or tell me about I this? I did have the, yeah, I did have most of the ending in mind. Little bits changed. Some bits changed. I went back and forth on, on some bits of the plot and I I almost overcomplicated something for myself and decided not to do that because I'm a absolute bogger for doing that with books yeah. I have a great idea I go, oh I could do this and then sometimes I overcomplicate it so much that I go no 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 I shouldn't do that um but yeah I try and it is hard isn't it because I'm I'm awful for guessing book endings yeah. and, and tv series and everything and my husband's I think even worse than me um because I think you, you do you read so much don't you and and also you you know when you write as well you get more familiar with the kind of the tricks of the trade right. and, <laughs> and everything else so I'm always I'm always thrilled when I'm surprised by stuff um, so I'm, I'm glad you didn't get that. I because I don't plan. I kind of you know write. I just write and see where we go. I, I vaguely have an idea of the ending, and I know roughly mostly kind of who's going to do it and why and what. Um, but that's some of my stuff changes along the way. So you know, I think that's what keeps it interesting for me. I kind of think if I'm constantly changing what I'm going to do, and I do, I do go back and forth sometimes, right up until the end, on whether that person will be the killer, this will be how it plays out, or whether I'll do something completely different, mm -hmm. which will then involve a lot of rewriting and be a nightmare. But because sometimes I'm not even sure up until the maybe 75% mark sometimes, <laughs> I hope that's perhaps what, what keeps it, you know, it harder for people to guess. Because sometimes I actually don't know 100%. So it can often be a very final last minute decision. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that keeps people on their toes. But it is hard. I think, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to make sure, you know, you're, you're trying to think about the next bit. And, and I'm, the bit I'm writing at the moment, I'm like, this is making it too obvious. So I need to do this here to cloud things and, and do that um, and confuse people. And then that will make it more difficult for me there. So I'm going to have to rewrite that, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's this constant process you're going through in your mind about trying to to keep keep your reader fooled because because you don't want to. It's okay to guess some things. I think. Yeah. I think it's it, you, you you can't rely on one big reveal. That's always right. my motto. You have to have lots of I think small reveals along the way, um, because because I think that keeps these keeps the reader interested oh I've got this I see that's happened there but then there's another one and there's something else and there's this and you've forgotten this and you didn't think of this um and I, and I think that's sort of the way I, I try and do it rather than try and just wrap it all up with one one thing yeah and I thought it was great and like every single person in that town could have done it so I didn't know what <laughs> exactly. 95 percent mark who it was I'm like you're all terrible we'll find out <laughs> um Okay, so just as we're wrapping up, I'm yes. just curious for writers who are maybe interested in branching out and blending genres as you have, what advice would you offer about blending genres, maintaining? Oh, I, yeah, I would say, yeah, don't overthink it. You know, I think just write. It, it sounds really simplistic, but write what you love. If you've got an idea and and you think, well, it's not really this or it's not really the other. I don't know where it fits into books. Just write it because the great thing is you then create a new genre. I yeah. think it, it can be easy to think to, to stop yourself doing something. And, and I, I was once told that, that my mashing up of genres by a, a, an agent was just not publishable. And, and it turns out they were wrong. So I think sometimes <laughs> sometimes just just go with your gut. And if you think you've got a great idea and a great story that you have to write, just write it. Because at the end of the day, it's not the writer's job to think about where does this fit in genre wise? Who does this appeal to? You know, you just write something that you really want to write and you love. And I think that that comes through. And I can think of lots of books that are successful. I won't now be able to think of any books that are successful. But things like something like Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Tomorrow is, do you know what I mean? If, yeah. if you sort of read, if you try and summarise something like that, you, you might think, oh, this doesn't sound like, this is this is not this type of book or this type of book. Um, and I think that, that the great thing about some successful books is that they are hard to, to, to classify. Um, and, and I think creating, you know, a new thing is much more interesting than, than trying to just do what's been done before. Yeah. So um, just go for it. Just just if you've got that idea that you think's great, just write it and then let, you know, someone else work that out afterwards. Create something new, create something different, create a new trend. Don't follow a trend. That's that's always my thoughts. All right. So Kaz did a vampire book, which is fun just because the market around vampire books has been 
so hot and cold. Um, you know, she said market didn't dictate her decision at all, but I'm curious about you. Do you look at market, like what's saturated or what are people wanting at all when you're considering your next book? No. I did with Behind the Closed Door. It, it came out of conversations I was having with the people working on some of my, my TV and film stuff in, in Hollywood and basically them telling me what they, they wanted to see because um, they tend to, to lead the way, I think, for the publishers. You know, the publishers are trying to feed that machine. Um, so yeah, Behind the Closed Door was kind of born from that. And, and it did work. I mean, I, I got an option on the film side before we sold the publication, right? So I think that does work. Um, and I, I do see the, the uh, ebb and flow of vampires constantly since writing the prequel to Dragon. Dracula. Um, you know, every, every Halloween, like around the end of September to like mid October or so, like I see huge bumps in sales, um, bookstores kind of bring it out of, you know, whatever storage closet it was in from last year. And they, they put it back out in the front window again. Um, and then it, then it vanishes. Um, and then when talking to the, uh, the film and TV guys on Dracul, you know, I see the same thing, you know, like, oh, well, you know, now's not a good time to shop it because this, this, and this are, is coming out over the next year. And then, you know, a year goes by and, you know, now is the time to hit because, you know, they, they, they start riding that wave. So, I mean, vamp vampires have been around basically since, you know, long before actually Bram created them. And it's always been an ebb, ebb and flow. Like, you know, somebody hits with a big story, then there's a, a million other ones that come out, then it disappears for a while because we get burnt. Um, and then it, it circles back around again. I personally never tire of vampires. I love yeah, them. No, I, love I will vampires. read them all the time. I was very sad that nobody wanted my vampire book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the trick is just to put it in a drawer for, for six months or a year yeah. and take it back yeah. out again. Yeah, try again. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question for you, JD. So you wrote Behind a Closed Door because there was a need for it. And you've also done Vampires. Would you write a book in a market that's saturated with that type of book? No, I've, I've always tried to, to lead the way there. Um, so like, when I wrote Fourth Monkey, um, when I started having conversations with the publishers, uh, I told them that I had done a look back to Silence of the Lambs because it was very similar to that. And if you look at the movies that came out right before Silence of the Lambs, I, there was Adam's Family um, and like a bunch of you know rom-coms and things like that. And then Silence of the Lambs hit and all of a sudden there was a, a slew of, of that type of a movie and, and book and like they just completely took over um so i look for trends like that and, and try to, to get in front of it and behind the closed door is another example of that you know like the, hollywood has shied away from you know like erotic thrillers and that type of thing over the last couple of years but you know, a lot of the people in that world feel it's a pendulum that swung just a little bit too far so they've been looking for something to kind of reignite you know movies that we had you know back you go about 20 years or so like basic instinct fatal attraction um the last time this wave hit there was a there was a slew of them and they feel like we're position for that to happen again. So I look for those kind of waves. That's cool. Um, the other thing that Kaz did that I thought was neat is she took uh, vampires, which are traditionally supernatural in books for the most part, and just made them part of the natural world. Yeah, I like I, that. I, I thought, yeah. 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 I'd love to hear, like, would you try something like that? What do you think about that? Uh, if I were going to do a vampire book, that's the way I would do it. Because everything else has, has really been done to death. You know, the idea of, like, a virus causing vamp vampires or, you know, the mystical part of it has been around for as long as we've known what a vampire was. Uh, I would want to – I like that idea of the sort of – natural predator part of the ecosystem that maybe we overlooked uh i like that w across all kinds of like cryptids and stuff too like i you know i i was always a, a nerd about uh bigfoot and sasquatch and everything and i even wrote <laughs> something uh related to that when i was very young but uh that idea that there somewhere there are pockets of these things that are part of the cycle of our our world but uh, are unusual or rare or in her in the case of hers like they're endangered that that was an interesting spin on that I like everything about vampires like I don't even mind um, when they stick to the more traditional the only thing I don't like is when they just assume you know the rules of the vampire you know um, yeah. In, in books or movies where they're ju they just kind of like leave things to the assumption like, well, obviously this is how it works. So yeah. I don't... Um, That's when it becomes cliche. Yeah, I, I don't actually... I like seeing what someone's going to do with the vampire, but I do need it to be thought out in terms of like why they chose vampires and how it's going to work in that world. Um, and as long as they do that, I am... I'm along for the ride. You put a vampire in something and there's like a 
90% chance I'll pick it up. One of my favorite pages in Bram's journals, he had rules for vampires written up at the top. And he had he, he had gone through every culture he could find because vampires have been around for a very long time yeah. in, in myth and lore and things like that. And he basically took every rule, every you know, every you know, thing that he could find on them and put them in there. And a lot of the rules were actually similar, you know, from culture to culture, mm-hmm. um, you know, but like little things have gotten twisted. So like in the rules that Bram had, vampires could walk in sunlight, but their powers were extremely weak. They were basically less than human at that point. Like they, they could tolerate it, but it didn't kill them. And then Nosferatu came out, you know, and that was, I think the first time a vampire actually burst into flames. Um, the only thing I really couldn't get on board with in, in this was, you know, her vampires don't have any money. And, and like me, the practical side of me is thinking, you know, if you're living for hundreds and hundreds of years, get a 401k, you, know, <laughs> you, you put, put a little bit away, you know, and, but they and wouldn't give them jobs. Oh, that was the thing. Yeah. Up. So she, she did it. She did explain it, but like, it would almost yeah. be hard not to make money if you're living for hundreds and hundreds of years, if you're, you know, financially sound and planning properly. So these, yeah, these vampires yeah. really need to sit down with somebody, I think, and, and work <laughs> they need a out. financial planner. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I roll my eyes at things like this, but th- you know, Having stories that are set up like this with uh, this race of vampires and everything, it's an interesting way. It's a kind of sideways look at like problems we have in our society and culture with like indigenous tribes and stuff. Like it's, you know, it's an interesting way to explore that. I'm I'm watching a show right now on Netflix called Resident Alien, uh, which is brilliant and hilarious if you haven't watched it. But it it kind of does this as well. Like he's an alien embedded and hiding out on earth and so they're using that as a platform to explore all kinds of you know all all these like cultural uh issues we might have and even things like you know exploring environmental justice and stuff like that yeah kaz always does a great job of that in her books really using genre to look at other things and other issues in society which is always cool i mean i like entertaining books but When you can do that too, that's awesome. Well, isn't that sort of the point of horror, you know, in in a lot of ways and not that like vampires are, but monsters in general, like, you know, it's to explore like those darker sides, not just of ourselves, but of like what those monsters represent in society um, at large. What, what is that fear tapping into and what is it saying? I think um, maybe that's another reason the rules are so important because I think that it really has to sort of tap into that and explore that or at least raise the questions. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to write the rules of being a vampire. And that, that's going to be... Oh, I want be, your Bigfoot. I'll it. do the Bigfoot. No. Oh, I'm going to combine the two. The rules of being a vampire Bigfoot. Wow. <laughs> nice. That would be awesome. Oh, so another thing that Kaz said that I thought was really interesting is that you can do whatever you want in a crime novel as long as you have a mystery. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> it feels true. Yeah, I mean, I think you can to a certain extent. Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to respond to that. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm. Yeah. I'm still. I'm still caught on her setting. Like Alaska is like the perfect place for vampires. For vampires, they're, yeah. Yeah. There, there's yeah. that movie with the Thirty Days of Night, which mm-hmm. I think is fantastic. Um, yeah. And the the latest season of True Detective is is set in Alaska, and like it really shows you just how isolated and everything they they are. Um, you know, just living in, you know, no sunlight for, for so long and just such a small town. And it's kind of the place where everybody goes when they want to, you know, either hide or, or, you know, just mm-hmm. get away from society. So like, you can, you can picture vampires hanging out there. Like that's where they, they would probably feel like they, they belong. Yeah. See, yeah. if they, if, if the scenario in that book, if there was a scenario similar to that in, in the world, uh, vampires would actually be recruited to do all kinds of stuff. Like if you were going to send somebody to colonize Mars, the, you know, you'd send, you'd send vampires cause they don't need oxygen. They don't need any of the things we need. Mm. So they could go get everything set up. There's less risk. See what I'm saying here? Here's yeah. my next book idea. And, Thank you. Kevin. And they'd, they'd, get, <laughs> they'd get a 401k through NASA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, now yeah. you, now you're employing these people. Now you've got a situation where you've got kind of like, you could go sort of the Tuskegee Airmen route where they're being exploited and, you know, you got all kinds of things you could, you could, uh, fall back on. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, this story's and evolving. You, I'm, you wouldn't want to be the only human on that spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. What if, what if you're the human, but your job is to be the, uh, the food source and, you know, you're taken care of and treated like royalty the whole time, but you have to daily supply, these vampires with uh with sustenance 
Man, oh, this book's going to be good. I can't wait. Now I, it's the Matrix, can't... except instead of machines, vampires are just feeding on you while yeah. you're in your battery. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll look forward to that. But yeah, I, I did think uh, we were talking about the movie Let the White Right One In, which is a fabulous, uh, yeah. which is also set, I can't remember where, it might be Finland, somewhere yeah. very, very snowy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, cold, bleak, small towns are so good for horror. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting, since we talk about AI all the time, and Kaz and I touched on that, is uh, that she talked about not being too worried about that because some of the best books are flawed and it's such a human thing. And after we we were uh, talking about that, I started thinking about Fight Club. I don't know if I talked about this before, but it breaks all the rules. It's 40,000 words. It's not a three-act structure. I don't know what the last third of that book is. Like, I love that book so much. Um but it is so flawed. But then if you watch the movie, they actually made it a three-act structure. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, we need to fix this. But the book was horribly humanly flawed. And it's probably one of the reasons it was so darn good. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> I mean, Fight Club's one of my favorite books for, for that yeah. same reason. And, and it's you know, fantastic. it's one of those, you, you read it for the first time and you get to that the ending and you're like, oh, crap. And then you got to go back and read it again just to see if he actually did the thing all the way yeah. through, you know, like it, it, and it played out and like it does. You know, very similar to like Sixth Sense, I guess, when you, you see that movie mm-hmm. for the first time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like if I remember right, the origin of that, I, didn't it start off as like a short story that he was just kind of working in his writer's group and he just kind of kept adding to it? Yeah. I vaguely remember I that being so. a, might be uh, right. Yeah. yeah. I get confused because so many were like that, right? Like Hugh Howey and I, I think yeah. the Martian started as something short, Andy right. Weir. So, but I mean, yeah, imagine that story like that. though at, at 80,000 words, like it wouldn't work, you know, it like it would work. be too yeah. long. Like it would just, it would fall apart. So like it was, it was just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I don't, I don't know if this was an experience that anyone else had, but with the film, so I have this weird thing where my, my brain catches little flickers in video really easily. So the first time I watched that film, the whole time I'm watching it, I, I, I was, I told Kara, it keeps flicking and I, and it looks like Brad Pitt. And it turns out that they did that. Like they would replace huh. a frame with Brad Pitt throughout the movie for like one frame huh. throughout the whole film. I never caught that, but that's awesome. I <laughs> caught it eventually, but only because Fight Club is one of those movies that like I have to watch every six months or like my soul drains or, <laughs> or something. Or, or stuff goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I see a Writers Inc. Uh, Fight Club watch party that's coming. Uh, we should do that. We'll live away. stream. We will live yeah. stream a Writers it's Inc. Such a brilliant movie. I mean, the book is brilliant too, but it's all I just I love. It's it's very yeah. good. That's another one of those. I know we're off track now, but um, there's a couple of of like book movie combos where the book and the film are very are just different enough that they're they're their own unique experience. That's one that I enjoy. And the other one is uh, David Brin's The Postman, mm-hmm. uh, which was an excellent book and an excellent film, but the two have almost nothing to do with each other. And I interviewed uh, David Brin a few years ago about that. And the funniest part about that is like he and Kevin Costner hated each other to not get along. <laughs> <laughs> and he hated this. He hated the movie. So, oh, yeah. interesting. Oh, well. You can't win them all, I guess. All right. And while we're on Kevin Costner, JD, who's up next week? <laughs> no, not Kevin Costner. <laughs> <laughs> Now I feel bad for Dan. Next week, we've got Dan Kaplan coming on. Dan's with Autocrit, one of our sponsors and one of my favorite writing tools, particularly when it comes to teaching newer authors. Uh, He's going to run through an overview of what Autocrit can do today and give us an idea of what's coming down the road. So Dan Kaplan, it's going to be good. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.